right, it's now 12.05, so let's start officially. Welcome to today's talk, part of the MRL webinar series by my colleague, Dr. Rodel Remy. Dr. Remy is a research scientist here at MRL who joined in October 2018. Prior to this, he was a scientist at the Advanced Materials Characterization Lab at the University of Delaware for two years. Rodell obtained a BS in Physics from Lincoln University, Pennsylvania, and a PhD in Materials Science and Engineering from the University of Delaware. His PhD research under Professor Michael Mackey focused on advanced thermal characterization of semiconducting polymers in, in both uh, bulk and thin film states. And that's related to what he's going to talk about today. This is uh, one of the webinars in the MRL webinar series. There was one last week, and these will all be at noon Central Standard Time. So, Rodell, if you could advance the slide once. Um, the next slide here has a list of the upcoming talks, and we're scheduling some even further out into the year, but this is just the ones that are through mid-May. You can go to go.illinois.edu slash webinars to see the abstracts for these talks and to register for them. Uh, with that, I'd like to welcome you to the webinar, and I'm sure you're going to enjoy this as much as all of us who've been looking forward to it. So, Rodell, take it away. All right. Thank you, Kathy, for the introduction. Um, so today we will be discussing uh, soft materials characterization. Um, and what I'll be describing today is uh, sort of both the instruments and the techniques themselves. It just turns out that both of them are typically synonymous with each other. Um, so the instruments are basically based around a specific technique. So you, that's what we will be discussing today. Um, one of the main issues is that uh, soft materials is such a very, very broad term. Um, it generally doesn't always help people to, to understand sort of what area of science we're really in. So I like to narrow it down a little bit by not just saying soft materials, but to say polymers. And that's sort of an area or a, a subset of the soft materials community. Um, so what is a polymer? And first thing is to break down the actual word. And it comes from the Latin. Uh, two pieces of the word. So the first one's poly and miros, meaning poly meaning many and miros meaning parts. So a polymer consists of many parts. Um, pretty basic, but still you kind of get the gist of, of what the word means now. But then how do we make polymers? It's actually made up of a lot of chemically linked uh, monomers. So monomer meaning one. So one part makes many parts. Great. That doesn't help very much. What we do, however, is that we have um, a specific, a specific mole molecule that we can chemically react with either itself or other uh, molecules to create this long chain of molecules, and that is called a polymer. If the molecule we're reacting is reacting with itself, um, we, we call that a homopolymer. If we are reacting it with more than one molecule, so if you're mixing monomer A and monomer B, we call that a copolymer. If you're mixing three monomers, we call that a terpolymer, and so on and so on. Um, not too many people venture more than three because things get pretty wacky pretty quickly. But uh, there are many, many polymers in the world that exist. They are produced quite in quite large volumes, one of them being polyethylene. This is actually the simplest uh, polymer. Um, because it only contains carbon and hydrogen. Uh, you will have seen or interacted with polyethylene at some point in your life, and you probably are interacting with it right now. Um, any, basically, any grocery bag is a polyethylene uh, material. So, and it's also used for those that are more laboratory-based. If you're into wet chemistry and you have your uh, waste container, most likely it's polyethylene. So it's, it's pretty much everywhere. Uh, the other one that's quite common as well is polyethylene terephthalate, also known as PET. Um, this is actually a copolymer, so it consists of two uh, monomeric pieces, this phthalate in between, and this uh, double carbon um, with the oxygen bonded to it. 
This is actually also extremely common. Um, if, you're, if you have a plastic water bottle sitting next to you right now, or you're possibly drinking out of it, that's actually polyethylene terp phthalate. So again, very, very um, mass produced item. The other one here is polymethyl, polydimethyl siloxane, uh, also known as PDMS. Um, also, you may hear versions of this be just called under the generic name of silicone. So things like caulking and weatherproofing may probably have some uh, version of this molecule or of this polymer actually mixed in there. Um, it's also, again, very, very popular in society. Now, these are all really, really long names for polymers. These are the sort of chemical names. And more often than not, you will hear polymers be called mostly by their trade names or some abbreviation thereof. Um, in this case, things like Kevlar, plexiglass, Teflon. These are words that we use quite often in society today, whether you're a, a scientist or not. But they are all polymers. They are just have uh, specific names, either trade names, or we just shorten their chemical names into uh, a few acronyms like PVC, ABS, PDMS, just like we have here. So polymers are pretty much everywhere. Um, they are a class of soft materials. They come in a variety of different um, properties to them. And so there are specific instruments that generally in the polymers world or the polymers community, you will generally see data come from in order to help examine and understand the properties of these polymers. Now, by no means are the instruments that I'm, and techniques I'm describing today specifically exclusive to polymers or soft materials but they are just more common um, in that field. So a shameless plug, uh, at the MRL, we have the Center of Excellence, Center for Excellence in Soft Materials that uh, contains this uh, group of instruments here that I will be talking about today individually. Um, this is the laboratory that I am responsible for. And so we have six instruments in, that, in this laboratory. Um, actually, we have more than six and you may see a few extras at the end of this talk. But the first thing we're going to look at is this one over here in the top left hand side. And the name of that instrument and the technique specifically is called gel permeation chromatography. Um, strangely enough, the, the most complicated word in out of these three is actually gel. Uh, chromatography simply means that you are separating a mixture of things that have been dissolved in a liquid or dispersed in a liquid or gas. In this case, it will be dispersed in a liquid. Permeation, we kind of all know what it means to have something permeate through another thing. Um, and the problem is how do we, what, what exactly is a gel? So if you look at the actual process of what GPC is and what it's actually doing, first thing we start off with is what's called a, a column or a GPC column. And this column consists of a lot of small beads. These beads on the order of about 10 microns uh, in diameter. And they are packed in this column, typically a metal casing. Um, and it is constantly flowing uh, liquid through this column, right? So remember the chromatography part of it, it's always gonna be in liquid. So what are these beads? These beads are what we actually call the gel. And they're actually not always spherical. Um, you can see that they normally have either pores like this or channels going all the way through them. And the reason why they're called a gel is because they are actually made of a polymer that is cross-linked. Um, cross-linking, what that does, it helps this bead hold its shape. So when you cross-link something, you are sort of, um, Think of a fishing net where you have everything essentially tied, is tied together into one large structure. And that's essentially what's, what this is generally made of. There are other materials that it can be made of that are not polymers, but uh, I would say for most GPCs that you will encounter, they will be a polymer-based gel. So I want to test my uh, sample, my polymer sample. So I inject my polymer, then what happens? First thing is we need to understand what a polymer looks like when it's in solution. And basically it looks like just a bunch of random, almost spaghetti-like strands sort of floating around in this solution. Uh, 
instead of tracing, so remember, along this strand, there are many, many, many monomers, right? So instead of tracing each one of these monomers to see where it's going in the system or in the solution itself, what we can do is we can say, okay, well, they're all connected to each other. So if one moves, then the other one must move in concert with it. So if we define a sphere of a radius uh, known as the hydrodynamic radius or the uh, hydrodynamic volume of the sphere, then we don't have to track each one of these monomers. We can just track the sphere as it moves around. So we're almost treating it like a nanoparticle, essentially. And so what happens? If I have a mixture of different chain lengths, aka different molecular weights of my polymer, then what will happen is if I have a really small one and one that is smaller than the pore size in the, in the gel, then this polymer will simply move and interact with this pore and then move back out as it's passing all the way down through the column, all right? Now for a bigger one that's bigger than the pore size, of course, it won't really care what, what that pore is or if it's even there at all, it'll just move right by. So what happens is as your polymer solution is moving through the column, the path length of the smaller molecular weights is much longer. And therefore it takes longer for smaller molecular weights or smaller chain lengths to move through the system than it would take for bigger ones. And that's how the separation process actually works in the chromatography column. So at the end of it, of course, you have to detect it. You have to figure out you know, how well it's separated and how many um, separations you have. So we have to attach some detectors at the end of the column. And you will end up getting a result that looks something like this. What you see here is every peak corresponds to a specific molecular weight that was in this solution of polymethyl methacrylate uh, in dimethylformamide. Dimethylformamide is a common solvent for this polymer. So like I said before, the larger molecular weights will come out first. So if I time uh, the, or I measure the elution time, as it's actually called, the larger molecular weights come out first, and then you get smaller and smaller and smaller until everything uh, goes through the column. So what that means is that as I increase my elution time, say if I keep measuring, essentially I am measuring smaller hydrodynamic radius or volume and therefore decreasing molecular weight. So that's basically the overall description of what a chromatography column or GPC actually does. In terms of the instrument itself, the one that we have here at MRL looks like this. It's a Tulsa Ecosec 8320. Uh, typical solvents for GPCs are, well, typical solvent is really THF or tetrahydrofuran. Um, it's very, very common. It dissolves quite a few um, common polymers, and therefore that's why it's sort of generally used through most equipment. However, you can run other solvents uh, as long as you have the correct columns. So like I said before, the columns are generally made of cross-linked polymers. So if this polymer is severely affected by the solvent that's passing through it, then you will not get efficient separation and or you can actually potentially destroy that column. So you wanna make sure that you pair the solvent with the right column to make sure that everything works smoothly. We also have ovens that basically keep the temperature. Um, the temperature also helps us uh, manage the pressures because we are flowing solvents through really, really tiny openings. So there's gonna be lots of pressure um, building up. <clears throat> So you wanna make sure that we keep that um, as under control as possible and the ovens and changing the temperature help us do that. We also have, again, a series of detectors that we can use to detect uh, the mole different molecular weights that are coming out as they are separated. Uh, for us, we have three detectors, uh, a refractive index detector, a UV detector, and a light scattering detector. So more about detectors. They all have their sort of unique traits. Uh, the refractive index detector is basically a detector that you will almost always encounter when you look to, when you go to do GPC um, in any laboratory. It's the standard one that comes with almost every instrument. UV visible is also one that could be there. Um, this is best used for copolymer analysis. So if you have a monomer A and monomer B, 
and you go through your separations process or and you're not sure what fraction of monomer A to monomer B you actually have, if one of them has a very strong absorbance in the UV visible spectrum, then you can tune this detector to line up exactly with that one uh, absorbance peak. And therefore it will only detect, that's, let's assume monomer A is that choice, it will only detect monomer A, whereas the refractive index will detect everything. So the ratio of these two essentially will give you what the ratio of monomer A to monomer B is in your copolymer. So that's one of the uh, pretty powerful uh, use of the UV vis um, detector. But the downside for both of these detectors is that they are calibration based, which means that I have to take a very, very well known standard and run that standard. Uh, actually, the data that you saw before was one of those standards, polymethyl methacrylate. And because I know exactly what those molecular weights are, I can create a calibration curve, okay? Then when I run my unknown sample, or the sample that I actually want data from, I will compare it to that calibration curve and see what the best uh, estimate of the molecular weight is based on the calibration that I just ran. So the downside to that is in terms of the polymer in solution, you're actually making the assumption that your unknown polymer is exactly identical in the way that it moves and organizes itself in the solution that, that the calibration standard is. And that unfortunately is very seldom true. So these calibration-based detectors tend to give good estimates and good comparisons but in terms of exacting molecular weights, especially for more difficult polymers, um, they tend to be a little bit off. And that's why we have these other two down here, the light scattering detector, as you can see, uh, we won't go too much into the math, but all you need to know is that this molecular weight here is related directly to this Rayleigh ratio, and the Rayleigh ratio is related to the intensity of scattered light. So basically, once your polymer gets to the detector, it scatters light, and that amount of light scattering is directly related to the molecular weight of that polymer. So there's no calibration to be done per se, it's just a direct conversion from the scattering that it's detecting to the molecular weight of the polymer. And the viscometer is very similar to that, where the intrinsic viscosity of the polymer, of the solution, is directly related to the molecular weight as well. Um, given these two constants K and A, which are called mark who ink parameters. Um, for many, many polymers, these parameters have actually been found. So you can actually look them up in reference books um, in order to help you calculate your molecular weight. Now, with all that said, a very strong note here is each detector, because of how each one works, will give you a different molecular weight. So don't get too worried about that. Um, all you need to do is be consistent with what you are using or what detector you are most paying attention to. If you only have a refractive index detector, that's fine. We all know in the polymers community what it is, what it does, and its weaknesses. So as long as you tell us that's a detector that you're using and the calibration that you used, you're fine. Um, same thing with the light scattering. We know what light scattering does. We know the relationship. So as, if you tell us that you're going to use the light scattering data, to analyze your polymer, that's fine as well. Just make sure that you let us know which one you're using in order to uh, continue with your, your research. So that in essence is gel permeation chromatography. So we're using it to analyze the molecular weights of a polymer, which correlate to how many monomers essentially are linked together in this chain, okay? So the other thing that we can do uh, the other technique that we can do is called light scatter. So I promised a, a little bit of this, so I will go uh, not necessarily quickly, but there's a lot of things I'll be leaving out. Um, what I will say is that especially for most of these techniques, you could essentially make an entire webinar on its own. But uh, given the time that we have, I will go, uh, I'm being quite brief in the overall de descriptions of some of these things. Um, so for the light scattering, the first technique uh, we're going to talk about is called dynamic light scattering. 
Um, typically, when you use the word dynamic, you're talking about some time base that you're measuring over. Uh, the general uh, instrument setup is you have a laser, you have an attenuator that uh, controls the intensity of the laser, you have a cell that contains your sample. Uh, again, this is a liquid-based technique, so your sample will be dispersed in some solvent. And so when the laser uh, hits your sample, in this case, your sample is typically nanoparticles, uh, so things that are dispersed in that, in that solution are either nanoparticles or generally treated as nanoparticles, just like the polymer was treated somewhat like a nanoparticle in the chromatography column. What happens when the laser interacts with that sample or with that particle is that you get scattering in all directions. When all you need to do now is select a specific direction and some directions are easier in terms of the mathematics that's required to convert things like doing it at nine, detecting at 90 degrees eliminates a lot of angular things that make math a little bit more complicated. Um, doing it in a backscattering mode, so a very large angle from the incident beam, that uh, actually helps some practical things like having multiple scattering events and dealing with concentration difficulties, things like that. So you can select your angle of detection and basically you're gonna process the signal. So what's actually happening here? Once you, your laser hits your particle in solution, it will scatter light and that will be time zero, let's say. So at time one, that particle has moved just a little bit, okay? So it's no longer in the exact same position that it was at time zero. So you collect that scattering as well. And what happens is that the correlation between that time zero scattering and time one scattering, let's call it, these things are related until that particle basically moves so far away that it's no longer related. And you end up getting a decay curve that essentially converts itself into a size plot. So we have here the intensity versus the size of the nanoparticle that you are um, examining. In this case, we have two different particle sizes, one somewhere a little bit less than one nanometer for its peak, and then one somewhere around 150 nanometers. Uh, this is the diameter in this case. You can also convert it to a radius, whichever one you prefer. If you remember nothing else about the light scattering that I'm, going to, that I'm explaining today, remember this one message. The intensity of the light that's been scattered by that particle is proportional to the radius of the particle to the sixth power. What that means is if I have two particles, just two particles, and one of those particles is twice as big as the other, that particle will scatter 64 times more light than the smaller one. So that means that this uh, technique is heavily weighted towards larger particles. Even if you just have one in there, that can very much show up in your data uh, and it can definitely affect some results and analysis that you do later on. So if you remember nothing else about light scattering, remember this, the light scattering intensity is directly proportional to the radius of the particle to the sixth power, okay? So the other uh, light scattering technique that I wanna show today is called zeta potential. This has to do with the charge on the particle surface. So in this description here, we have a particle, a solid particle in the middle, and it's actually negatively charged. Actually, most things are negatively charged on their surface. Not all, but quite a few. And so therefore, if you, are, you have this particle in a polar liquid, then the positive parts will be attracted to the surface of the particle. And that essentially will, you, again, decay away as you move further away from the particle. So as you move further away from the particle, this polar liquid will no longer care that the particle is there. And there is a boundary between when it's strongly affected and essentially not affected at all by the particle, and that's called a slipping plane. And that's where we measure our zeta potential. And as you can see, because when you go further in, you get stronger, then there's a correlation between that slipping plane and what's actually on the surface of the, of the particle. 
So how do we physically measure that? Well, if you apply a charge or, or a bias voltage across that liquid with your particles in it, and we oscillate it at some frequency, what will happen is that the particles will sort of move back and forth, back and forth, back and forth across the beam, the incident beam, and therefore across the detector. So we start getting this sort of oscillating uh, light scattering at the detector um, interval. So if you have multiple particles, multiple sizes, or multiple charges, then these all start interfering constructively and destructively with each other, and you get what's called a Doppler pattern. That Doppler pattern is then converted into your zeta potential plot, where you can actually see where the highest probability of your surface charge is. Uh, in this case, it's somewhere around 60 for the particle that you are measuring. So that's basically how it's measuring the zeta potential. And the zeta potential, as I, as I said, is related to the surface charge of that particle. So for example, if you change the chemistry of that surface, then of course you will be changing the uh, overall surface charge and therefore the zeta potential will reflect, that, will reflect that. And that's one of the things that people do uh, in terms of using this technique is they tend to change the chemistry of their surfaces one way or another and measure the zeta potential to see how well they actually did. At MRL, we have uh, one of these instruments as well. It's called a Malvern Zeta Sizer, a uh, Nano ZS version. We can measure particle sizes using our dynamic light scattering method, all the way down to about half a nanometer, going all the way up to in the range of five to six microns. For zeta potential, uh, like I said, most things have negative zeta potential. We can also measure a few things in the positive zeta potential range, but not too far out in positive. And the particle sizes, we can tolerate a little bit larger than the actual particle size uh, up to about 10 microns. So although you may not get a great particle size measurement, it, it's still worth it if you are interested to try the zeta potential to see if you get a stable value or not. The other thing it can do, um, if again, uh, looking at going back to the chromatography, remember light scattering was one of those detectors that we can use. So you can also measure the molecular weight of polymers using this instrument. Uh, the downside is that as opposed to having the chromatography column doing all the separations and running things sort of continuously for you, in this case, you would have to sort of do individual experiments and then do some of the, the calculations a little bit later. So it's a little bit more work, but we can still achieve it with this instrument. The other thing you can do as well is looking at effects of pH or salt. Um, this tends to uh, be very helpful for those in, in the bio uh, regime where we can do um, a lot of isoelectric points and things like that. And of course, we can use a range of solvents. So if, you're, if your particles don't disperse very well in water or something of that nature, of course, you can change solvents to get it dispersed better. Uh, we just have to basically tell the instrument what solvent you're using. All right, so we have uh, light scattering here, and that's all I'd like to say about it. As I said before, there's a lot more that I can say about it, but given our time, that's where we'll, we'll wrap that up. The other technique we have is thermal analysis. So this is actually a group of techniques. Um, so here we are actually going to use heat, hence the word thermal, to investigate different things about our material. One of the first techniques I will show is called thermogravimetric analysis or TGA. If we break down this word here, of course we have thermo, so heat-based, gravity, which sounds like gravity, right? And gravity affects how much things weigh, right? So if we measure how much things weigh in terms of changing or at different temperatures, then we are essentially doing a TGA analysis. It just so happens that we have, you know, actual instruments that do these things for us. So an example here of one type of TGA, um, we have the thermocouple right here that gives us our temperature, our sample sits in there, and below is a furnace that will, of course, after this moves away, 
will move up and encapsulate this entire thing. And that will be what's controlling the temperature. So all we will be doing is essentially, once your sample sits on here, it will be pulling on this uh, very thin metal wire and that will tilt a balance essentially. And therefore we will be cons consistently measuring mass as we increase the temperature using the furnace. And you can get data that looks something like this. This is calcium oxalate monohydrate. It is a very commonly uh, used um, material in terms of defining or describing TGA because it has these beautiful individual steps that are nicely separated in temperature. So it's very easy to sort of look at in terms of describing how things operate. So what you're seeing here is we start off with 100%. So that's all of your material. And as we change temperature or we increase temperature, we get a transition. This transition indicates that we've lost some weight in our sample. And we can calculate how much that is, right? By basically, you know, beginning, you know, end minus beginning or beginning minus end. And we can see that we've lost about 12% of our material. Now in calcium oxalate monohydrate, that monohydrate means one water. Basically, this uh, molecule has a water molecule attached to it. And therefore, at the appropriate temperature, the water essentially boils away. And if you do the chemical calculation, it's about 12% of the total material. So if we um, identify here, this green curve is the derivative weight. What that is, is the derivative of the weight versus temperature. Sometimes you can do it with versus time as well. And this actually helps us identify smaller transitions like this one right here. If we just look at this step, it doesn't really tell us that we have a smaller um, transition hanging out right in this corner. But when we take the derivative, we can see that that's what's happening. And for certain uh, materials, that can actually be very important because it can indicate that some different type of process, some different type of thermal process or thermal degradation process is actually occurring that we could have easily missed if we just looked at our weight curve, okay? So that's essentially what TGA does. And there is one thing that applies not just to TGA, but for pretty much all thermal analysis instruments, and that is called thermal lag. So this occurs when you start changing your heating rates or you change your sample masses appreciably. So what actually happens as you look at this uh, graph right here, this is the same calcium oxalate monohydrate, but we're doing it at three different heating rates, okay? Five degrees per minute, 20 degrees per minute, 50 degrees per minute. Now these are all the same three transitions that I showed you just now, but you can see that they're occurring at very, very different overall temperatures. And that is because, and mainly only because, we are changing our heating rate. So what's the actual process here? Well, my best uh, metaphor or, or analogy for this is if you like to grill, of course, the, uh, the temperatures uh, as we approach summer are going to get much better for actually grilling outside. You, you know, take your grill out and you turn it on and heat it up. Okay. Maybe you heated it up way too high in the beginning. And then you throw your favorite food on that grill. What's going to happen to that food? It is going to obviously burn, okay? And what's actually happening is that the outside of the food is cooking while the inside of the food is still cold. So you're actually creating a thermal gradient inside of your food and therefore inside of the sample, okay? just because you've heated it up such a, at such a high rate. And what happens then is that the food or the sample will have to take time to actually begin uh, its actual transition. And that causes it to be pushed higher in temperature, okay? So 
This could be advantageous if you want to look at certain processes happening in materials, but generally when we're looking at comparing different things, the main thing is to make sure that you're running everything under the same heating rate and generally under the same experimental conditions to negate this effect. All right, so always make sure that we pay attention to thermal lag. Um, in this case, this is showing heating rates. It also happens with larger sample masses because you have more stuff in order to go through the same transition. So obviously it will take longer and therefore it will appear as if it is happening at a higher temperature. So that is thermal lag and that is something that we need to be very, very careful and pay lots of attention to once we start uh, doing thermal analysis in our materials. So in terms of instruments and capabilities, what we have here uh, at MRL is a TA Instruments Q50. Its experimental conditions are typically from ambient to a thousand or above. Some TGAs go all the way to about 1500 degrees. Um, and then we have our heating rates that go from 10 to 20 C per minute in a variety of atmospheres, depending on what you're doing. And then we have our pan types, either platinum or aluminum oxide, especially because we are going up to such high temperatures. These are, you know, some of the few that will survive in those temperatures. And you can measure quite a list of things going on down here. Sample degradation, like I showed just now, things like residual solvents, absorption of gases. Um, a cool one is the Curie temperature that actually uh, is the temperature at which a ferromagnetic material loses its magnetism. It's actually quite in, a quite interesting experiment. And if you wish to know more about it, definitely contact me and we can talk about it. So the other instrument that I want to describe today is called a differentiating differential scanning calorimeter. And there's actually two types of this instrument. The first type is called a power compensation calorimeter. This is where you actually have two furnaces and in one furnace is a reference. So you have an empty sample cup or pan uh, sitting on a detector that typically is some sort of thermocouple or temperature sensing device. And that has its own furnace. And then in the other furnace, we have your same sample cup or an identical sample cup with your sample sitting inside. And what we do is we are actually setting a heating rate for both of these furnaces to accomplish. And once the sample undergoes some transition, it will typically lag behind or jump forward of the reference. So you can adjust the power of the furnace to keep up or slow down according to what the reference is doing. So you're actually measuring a direct power for each furnace and hence called power compensation, okay? The other one is called a heat flux method or heat flux DSC. We still have our reference in our sample pan. And then in this case, as opposed to having two furnaces, we only have one, okay? We still have our uh, thermocouple sitting below the pans. So once we are heating it up, we're only heating up this one furnace and both of these samples are sitting inside of it. So when the sample undergoes its transition, as opposed to uh, monitoring the power, we're monitoring the change in temperature as the sample undergoes its transition. So this method was actually adapted from an older method called differential thermal analysis, where all you were getting in terms of your output data was this delta T function. Um, but then the people who were much smarter than I decided that, hey, we can convert that into a power uh, using the right calibrations and knowing certain things about the instrument. And therefore, these two, we can obtain essentially the same data from these two instruments. So in this case, the power compensation uh, measures the heat flow directly. And this is actually the original DSC method. This was the first thing to be called a DSC. Um, but the heat flux DSC, uh, although it still does this conversion, it's actually much more common to be found in laboratories today. Uh, they both have their pluses and minuses. Uh, the power compensation tends to be uh, much better and much more stable for a high heating rate experiments. So when you run, a, run your experiments at, at heating rates above, let's say 100 degrees per minute, uh, 
then you tend to end up uh, limiting yourself to a power compensation method. However, the heat flux method, because it was based on an older method called DTA, actually tends to handle higher temperatures overall, um, just based on what materials they can be made out of. Um, but again, you know, with advances in technology and et cetera, I'm sure those differences are getting smaller and smaller every day. So what kind of actual data do we get out of this? Well, for soft materials, we can get three, at least three uh, different types of transitions from uh, this instrument. The first one is called the glass transition. And that typically looks like a step change in your uh, scan. That is a transition from what we call a rigid material. So imagine something just being frozen in place to something that's now somewhat mobile. Um, for those polymer physicists, we understand the concepts of reputation and other things like that. So that happens after the glass transition. Um, then we go into a, what's called a crystallization. So if your material has the ability to form a three-dimensional structure uh, known as a, a crystal, then in order for it to go from a disordered state into this ordered crystal, it has to actually lose energy. So this is actually an exothermic process. Um, and then that energy is essentially lost and the material can then go into that three-dimensional structure. Once it is in that three-dimensional structure and we keep heating it up, of course, that three-dimensional structure will then break down and that's called melting. And this is, the melting is essentially the opposite of the crystallization. So if we have something that's, mel that's melting, it's now going from an ordered uh, state to a disordered state. And again, it will, instead of lose energy, it would need energy to regain all those de degrees of freedom that we lost when it's crystallized. So this is what it will sort of look like. This specific material here is our friend polyethylene terephthalate, that plastic water bottle that I talked about in the beginning. Um, and this is what it looks like if you were to put it in a DSC. Um, so what can you do with it? We can do uh, quite a few things. Glass transition temperatures, like I showed before, our percentage crystallinity. That's basically the difference in the energy of crystallization. So the difference in this energy versus that energy will tell us how many crystals were there or what percentage of crystals were there before we started the experiment. In this case, the subtraction of these two gives us about 10 joules per gram, which for PET is somewhere around 10% crystalline. So um, we can use these numbers with some very simple algebra to calculate percent crystallinity. We can also look at phase transitions of different forms, including solid-solid phase transitions. So if it goes from crystalline type A to crystalline type B, we can also do that as well, among a, long, a, a list of other uh, things that we can observe in the actual DSC. Uh, our heating rates tend to be similar to TGA. Uh, our temperature ranges can be similar. Uh, for this instrument specifically, this is the temperature range here from about liquid nitrogen temperatures up to around 400 Celsius. Uh, we have another instrument at MRL, it's called a DTA. Remember I said that older technique that can go really high in temperature? Well, we do have one of those as well. Um, again, most of the other experimental conditions are quite similar. Um, the difference is it's much more difficult to convert the energetic uh, transitions into an actual energy uh, unit that we can use, but you can still see when they occur and what temperature that they occur so we can still identify at least what the transitions might be. Okay, so our last thing here is mechanical analysis. And this is now essentially looking at what happens to my material when we apply force to it. And there are many, many ways we can apply force to a material. In this case, we have all the way from a bending force. So if you apply force down to the center of this material, it will, up, it will start deforming this way. Torsion, so we start twisting the material. Tension, where we pull on the material and stretch it. Of course, doing the opposite, which is compression. And of course, we can do shear. For soft materials, we sort of order it like this, where we have 
the stiffest materials tend to use these, especially these two um, types of mechanical analysis methods, whereas the softer ones tend to go down this direction until we get to shear where we can actually measure things even in liquid state. So we can get to very, very soft materials and materials that are dissolved in solvents, like polymers dissolved in solvents, jets, very, very soft gels, etc. And then uh, we can obtain mechanical base information from that. The main thing that you should always try to do is choose the correct mode for the application that you are running. So if you have a material that the main application for this material is to be sandwiched between two things and a compressive force is always going to be applied to it, then you want to use the compression mode to identify what types of forces or what types of reactions you expect from your material. If it's something that's going to be twisted a lot, of course, you want to probably try torsion if it's a really stiff material. If it's a softer material, you probably, probably want to go with shear. So always try your best to uh, choose the appropriate mechanical mode for the application that you are using. Um, of course, you know, not every lab you go into will have every single one of these. Um, at MRL, we have the single dual cantilever um, and the tension clamps for our uh, mechanical analysis instrument. Um, and we've just gotten one where we can do a fair amount of shear uh, measurements as well, as I'll describe a little bit later. So, quick example of a mechanical analysis test under being done. This is a stress strain curve essentially being produced. And if you listen really carefully, you hear that little crack. That actually, um, well, first of all, this material is a glass screen protector. So for those who may be very clumsy with their phones, like I was at one point, um, you probably cracked your screen quite a few times. So a glass screen protector is probably uh, your best friend. So the glass screen protector, of course, is made of glass. And the glass is actually quite brittle, but it's still strong. So the first instance of this data is basically the mechanical properties mainly of the glass. Okay, But when you heard that little crack, that was the glass failing, which happened right there. And so... What you can do now, or what you observed, is that as opposed to the glass basically just shattering and going everywhere, it actually stayed in generally one piece. And that's because at the back of the glass, or in between that glass screen protector and your actual screen, is a layer of adhesive. So once that glass fails, the adhesive kicks in, okay? And because the glass is so much stronger than adhesive, you have a massive shift in your distance moved, or represented by the strain units, and then your force increases again because this is now the behavior or mostly the behavior of the ad adhesive backing, okay? And again, the glass maybe cracked a little bit more and a little bit more as we kept going further and further out. So this is not the perfect data, but it is definitely one of the practical aspects of doing mechanical analysis on a material. So what else can we do? We have uh, typical experiments. We can do temperature-based experiments on instruments like ours, our Q800 DMA. We can go all the way up to about 600 degrees. Our heating rates are actually much slower than uh, thermal analysis because we, tend, we have to heat up a lot more stuff, right? This is all metal in here. So you have to make sure that all of that metal comes to the same temperature. So you can't heat up very quickly you have to use much slower heating rates when you're doing mechanical analysis. Our force limit is quite low, and that's because it is mainly geared towards softer materials. Um, but we do have quite a bit of force resolution where we can get down to the micronewton range. So we can pull really, really, really lightly on uh, something, but we can pull you know, ridiculously strongly on anything. You can measure stress strain, which is what I showed you just now. You can also do phase transitions, curing, uh, transient modes. So if you hold uh, if, uh, or apply a specific force and hold it, um, you can see how the material relaxes. Uh, and that's called stress relaxation. That's a transient mode because you're basically tracking it over time. And you can do things like fatigue. But something like fatigue and these phase transitions actually 
do what's called dynamic mechanical analysis. And again, this is because we're applying an oscillatory force as opposed to a linear force like we were doing for a stress strain curve. Once we apply our oscillatory force, we actually get a completely different set of data. We get storage and loss moduli and 10 delta functions, which is if you divide your loss by your storage modulus. This tells you things like phase transitions, crystallization, melting, you can do curing analysis and all sorts of other things with this different mode. Um, without going too much into this mode, I will definitely make sure to tell you that you need to make, you need to tell everyone how you're actually measuring your material in this mode, because there's a lot more things um, that you need to adjust, a lot more experimental uh, parameters that you need to, to understand in order to make sure you're running this correctly. And therefore, when you publish your data or when you, you know, describe what you've been doing, you definitely want to add those to um, your description to make sure everybody's on the same page with what you were trying to accomplish. Okay, so remember I told you that we have now the ability to do strain testing, which I am extremely excited about. We have a new TA instrument discovery rheometer. Um, we have the ability to do strain testing over a large range of experiments, including what's called steady shear. So if you share in only one direction, um, you can also do frequency based. So you're sharing back and forth. Um, that again, gives you a totally different set of data, very similar to the storage and loss moduli we got for the oscillatory DMA that I showed just now. And of course we can do transient measurements as well. Um, we have a list of accessories, including um, a Peltier plate, a melt accessory that can go to quite high temperatures based on our testing accessory all the way up to 600. Um, so we can measure things going all the way from, you know, soft or even somewhat rigid gels all the way through to solution type measurements. Uh, rheology, again, is one of those uh, topics and techniques that, you know, literally requires probably more than one uh, webinar, but uh, this is just to sort of advertise that we do have one of these instruments now. Um, so once things get back to normal at MRL, uh, please uh, contact me to uh, let me know that you may have some interest in using it. And so that's what I have today. Um, we do have more coming, so always stay tuned. Next Thursday, we have Hongwei Zhu, Hongwei Zhu, sorry, uh, ex with her talk at her webinar at Advanced Scanning Electron Microscopy, what is available at MRL. Um, please register at the go.illinois.edu slash MRL webinars. If you have any questions beyond this talk today or anything that I can't take um, because of time, please feel free to email me um, and we can talk about it, especially if you have things that are more specific to your samples and things like that. Um, we also are participating in another webinar series uh, at Penn State, Making the Best of a Bad Situation, a Characterization, characterization Seminar Series. Um, so feel free to look into that as well. And with that, I will wrap up and say thank you all for listening, and I will take any questions that we may have had. Well, thank you, Rodell, for a wonderful talk. That was a great overview. Um, I've collected a few of the questions that um, we had during the, the seminar. Please feel free to continue to add more questions to the chat. I'll try to hit the more general questions first and then get into the specifics. And you can see Rodell's email address on the screen if you have questions that either we can't get to today or um, questions that you need more detail on. Um, Rodell, would you like to start with topics towards the end of the talk or topics towards the beginning, like GPC um, or DSC? Either way, uh, whichever one you think is most uh, practical. <laughs> okay, I'll probably have you uh, go back way to the beginning in thinking about this. Um, the first question is about the applications of GPC. Can we use GPC for characterization of a copolymer which can only be dissolved in a mixture of water and solvent? Um, that is possible in theory. Um, actually, there, there are a few uh, requests that I have that I am looking into in terms of um, things that are difficult, difficult to dissolve in just pure solvent. Um, the problem with that is normally if you have to mix it with water, it means that it forms um, 
or it has parts of the polymer like water and parts of the polymer don't like water. The problem with that is then they end up forming what's called a micelle, um, where it would, for example, if the water is the smaller component, it will trap a nice little bubble of water essentially. Um, and that is very, very difficult to pass through the instrument, um, mainly because you will get a very, very inaccurate uh, molecular weight because it's not in the nice random coil that I showed at, at the beginning of the slide. It's actually in a shape that doesn't help us uh, identify the, the overall molecular weight. And it also can cause clogging in the system, unfortunately. So that tends to be a bit of a challenge. Um, I am up for the challenge so far, but <laughs> it's definitely tricky. All right, thank you. Um, an another application question. Um, this one's on DLS. Um, a couple of DLS questions. One is, um, one group tends to sonicate samples beforehand due to the particle size it's being too large to measure with their instrument. And the researcher is wondering how the sonication impacts the structures and what sorts of artifacts or bias they may introduce by using that technique. Hmm. That's a great question. Um, it depends on what their sample is. If their individual particles are um, inorganic, like you know, you're doing gold nanoparticles or something like that, um, and the coatings are stable in terms of not being able to pop off, that's one of the biggest problems, um, then you should be okay. But um, there's a very limited range under which you will be okay. <laughs> um, Sonication is actually pretty aggressive, um, especially if you're doing it for, um, for soft materials, if you're doing biomaterials, micelles, things like that, where you can actually break the micelle and then the micelle will reform, but in a totally different size than it was originally. So that may or may not be good for you in terms of knowing what the original size of that micelle was. So I would exercise caution when it comes to using sonication to sort of break up your sample. Really, really consider what your sample is um, and the stability of that sample under that type of aggressive treatment. All right, moving on to zeta potential, so not moving on too far from that. Um, does the zeta potential indicate the surface potential of the samples? For example, if the zeta potential of a sample is negative, does this imply this material has negative charge? Negative charge on the surface, yes. All right, and with all these sort of uh, earlier techniques, what's the sensitivity or detection limit of the te techniques? Um, basically, how much sample is required and or how much concentration is required for them? And can you use them for contamination analysis? Like say, um, semiconductor industry level, uh, um, precision in the contamination detection? Uh, for semiconductor industry level, mm, that might be difficult because a lot of contaminants tend to be light in terms of mass. Um, if they affect the material appreciably enough, it might be possible. But for that level, you, that may not this may not be the specific technique that you might want to use. If you are doing polymers, as I said, or soft materials, um, for example, I can give you a story actually of when I was in uh, graduate school, I was using my DSC one morning and I think the evening before uh, someone else was using it and unknowing to me, some of their sample got in there. Um, and when I say some, I mean something that you literally cannot see if you were to open up the furnace and look inside. So it was just that small. And I still saw that data in my data. <laughs> so can you identify contamination? You definitely can. Um, it just depends on, again, many things are very much sample dependent. So you wanna consider you know, how heavy this contaminant is compared to your original material or how much will it actually affect um, the material you actually want to measure. Um, in terms of overall sample sizes, the vast majority of the, of the uh, techniques that I showed today, with the exception of, of the mechanical analysis, 
um, are on the milligram level. Um, so if you have milligrams of sample, you should be able to run um, at least one of the techniques that I showed previously. In fact, for light scattering, so looking at uh, particle sizes and things like that, you actually want to get lower than that, probably in the microgram level, um, so that you don't oversaturate detectors, so that you don't come into aggregation problems, things like that. So for GPC, we normally run, you know, as in my example, two milligrams per milliliter, five milligrams per milliliter are pretty much the typical concentrations. Uh, for thermal analysis, you're looking anywhere between five to maybe 20 or 30 milligrams of sample. Um, but for DMA, you need a sample that will fit on the instrument. <laughs> and that tends to be a lot more than you might think. Um, but for mechanical analysis, that's, again, that's very heavily end use based. So you want to consider, you know, what you're going to use it for at the end of it um, and try to shape your material as best as you can to fit into the specific clamp type or the specific mechanical mode that you want to use. I hope that answered everything there. <laughs> I think so. Thank you. Um, there's a series of questions on thermal analysis coming up, mostly TGA. Um, one of them is um, possibly about a plot, and that's in derivative TGA curves. I think you mm -hmm. showed one of them. Why did the derivative peaks appear skewed, sharper going down? So what determines the peak shape? That's all about the kinetics of the material. Um, <clears throat> most times, uh, materials will, mm, let's see, the easiest way to say that is that it is dependent on the kinetics of what's happening. So when you're losing mass, you're degrading your material, some part of your material is coming off and it's never coming back, right? So the rate at which that happens um, is a, a chemical factor. So it's the factor of the chemistry of the uh, activation energy of the bonds and all these other little things that can get in there. But also it's a factor of the rate of the, um, the heating rate, like I explained with the thermal lag effect. So most times the skewing of the curve is sort of intrinsic to the material. Okay, I could show a material that has a very nice, almost Gaussian looking curve, but that's just that one material. So that just depends on what chemistry is happening, uh, what kinetics are happening to uh, allow that material to degrade. All right, thank you. Um, a few practical questions about uh, setting up TGA. Uh, for the TGA, do the sample pan and the counter pan need to be the same material and weight? And what is the recommended sample weight for the best TGA analysis, which you sort of got into already? Yeah, the answer for them being the same material, absolutely. Um, or at least that's the best case scenario, but in general, for general, you know, good practice of thermal analysis in general, you want your sample and reference pan to be the same material as close to the same mass and size as possible. Um, luckily, most uh, people that make instruments like this sell their own pans, so their pans are very well suited for their, um, for the best results from their instruments. So if you are using a DSC, for example, then it's always best to use the pans that they recommend um, to avoid having to think about too many of those little offset issues. Um, so definitely make sure they use that the same pan, the same material, the same type of pan, because um, there are different pan types as well. Uh, in terms of uh, mass of sample, for DSC, you're going, mm, most times I would go in the range of 10 milligrams, maybe less, depending on how strong the signals are. Uh, for TGA, you may go a little bit higher to get rid of some other artifacts that may show up um, when you get close to the, the sort of noise level of the instrument. All right, thank you. Um, this is about the uh, TG curve. Um, if you have different behavior in the TG curve under different heating rates, can you get some thermodynamic parameters of the samples like heat flux, et cetera? Um, there are ways of extracting uh, kinetic base information from doing different heating rates, especially the TGA, for example you can actually calculate an activation energy by running uh, the same sample, uh, of course, about as close to the same mass as you can, 
and uh, running it under different heating rates. Uh, there is essentially a fitting factor and a, a little bit of math that you have to do to calculate the activation energy of that degradation step that you're interested in by doing that type of experimental set. Um, heat flux from doing that, uh, possibly, but I would have to look into that a little bit more. And it looks like we just got another TGA question, so I'll do one more TGA question before moving on to DSC. Um, if a ramp rate of 100 degrees per minute is used, the um, there will be a thermal lag, and so it won't ramp uh, linearly, but can you still trust the measurement with that nonlinear increase in temperature? Well, I would double check to make sure it's nonlinear, um, especially if it's nonlinear throughout the entire TGA curve. I have actually run 100 C per minute in, a TG, in our TGA before, and it stabilizes to in about eh, two-ish minutes or less. So it's actually still pretty good at 100 C per minute in terms of being actually maintaining a linear heating rate. Um, so it's still possible, but of course, yes, the thermal lag will be a huge factor and you kind of have to ask and understand why you're using such a high heating rate in the first place. <laughs> Um, uh, one more uh, TGA question. Does the TC measurement in TGA use an external magnetic field? In TGA, yes. So actually, um, for the Curie temperature measurement, I guess that's what they're uh, asking about. You actually do put a pretty strong magnet <laughs> um, under the furnace. Um, and what happens is that when your sample is inside of the furnace, it will feel that magnetic field. It, it will you know, experience that magnetic field and it will actually be attracted to it. And once it's attracted to it, it will tug on that you know, little metal wire and that will tilt the scale. So you will get an apparent mass increase before your Curie temperature. So when you get to your Curie temperature, that mass increase will go away because it's no longer cares that that magnetic field is around. So that's actually how you measure the Curie temperature is that you measure at what point does that apparent mass uh, go back or disappear essentially. Excellent, thank you. And now a DSC question. I can tell TGA is a super popular technique a lot of people are really interested <laughs> yeah. in. Um, can this DSC measure crystallinity in a thin section on a glass slide at ambient temperature? Uh, depends on what you would like to measure at ambient temperature, but potentially, yes. Um, there's ways that you can do things like that. Um, let's say, I mean, if you're doing anything at a constant temperature, I'm guessing you're measuring heat capacity or something of that nature, uh, or maybe some, to some sort of transient um, uh, isothermal hold. Those are possible with thin films. Um, like I said, I did measure thin films when I was in graduate school, but I did it a little bit differently where I, I actually removed them from my substrate because I was, I was able to do that. If you're not able to remove them from the substrate, um, you definitely want to make sure that you have you know, a nice uh, piece that can fit into the pan that can fit flat on the bottom because remember the sensors are at the bottom of the pan, right? So you sit it to the bottom of the pan and depending on how much energy um, that material is um, going to release or gain or what have you, you may not need anything else. If it is that it's going to release a very small amount of energy, what you can do is you balance with the reference side. So if you put a similar piece of the substrate only on the reference side, then that negates the, the influence of the reference of, uh, of the substrate, sorry, from the uh, actual curve and therefore you become more sensitive to the thin film that's on top. So there are ways to, to get around some of these, these issues. So Excellent. feel free to email me to talk about more if you, if you have interest in doing that. And one final question, this will be the last question and this is on the instrument that we're all super excited to have gotten right before the lab shut down, unfortunately. Oh. And we're all looking forward to seeing it again and that's the rheometer. How small of a sample can be measured on the rheometer? Uh, depends on what your sample is. Uh, we do have an eight millimeter plate. Uh, so it's eight millimeter diameter essentially. Um, and that, if you are doing a gel of some sort, uh, 
you may not need that much sample because your gap is only in the maybe half a millimeter or less. So half a millimeter times, you know, eight millimeters, that's about the volume of sample that you'd be using. Um, the smaller the uh, plate that you use, or the smaller the geometry that you use, um, the stiffer your sample should be. Um, because if you have a really, really low viscosity sample with such a small uh, area of sensitivity, then you can get a lot of noise. So if you have something that's really, really soft or you're measuring liquids, you actually want to go to slightly larger um, geometries, which will require, of course, a bit more sample. Excellent. Thank you all for your great questions and your attendance. And thank you, Rodell, for your great answers and your fantastic presentation. I want to encourage all of you to email Rodell if you have questions. Uh, his email address is on the screen and to go to the go.illinois.edu slash MRL webinars to sign up for next Thursday's talk or for future MRL webinars. And we'll see you next Thursday. Have a great rest of your day.